Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to our second uh, part of our webinar series on TTIP 2.0 and regulatory cooperation. Um, my name is Laura Große. I'm working with the German NGO Lobby Control. And today we have two brilliant guest speakers here to go a, more, a little more in depth in detail of the uh, current EU US trade talks. Um, before we start, I'll give you a short introduction to the plan for today and to the technical features. So you all should be able to see a little icon on the bottom line that allows you to raise your hand. Then a blue uh, icon will appear next to um, the name that you see. Maybe uh, Alessa, you could try to raise your hand quickly. Perfect, thank you. That, that's working. Um, then you have an option to uh, put questions in written form into the question and answers icon in the bottom um, that will be released um, after approval by me or by the uh, two panelists. Um, or you can you can choose to raise your hand and, 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 and ask a question uh, directly instead. Um, each uh, of them, Sharon and Kenneth, will talk about uh, 15 minutes, um, followed by a small brief slot where you can ask questions of understanding. But I kindly ask you to withdraw any questions that go more in depth uh, into expertise for the uh, for after the inputs, where we will go into a more open discussion. Um, just to give you a quick recap, recap uh, last week, Alessa Hartmann from PowerShift and I presented a more general introduction into the problems um, of regulatory cooperation, um, especially with regards to uh, democratic principles, uh, democratic ground rules and the specificities um, of, of of the shape that regulatory cooperation takes in the current uh, trade talks between the EU and the US. And today we will have uh, a closer look um, at issues of regulation and how they are uh, handled in different ways in the EU and the US. Um, Sharon will start off with an, with an introduction to the different regulatory environments and especially um, give us insights uh, into how the notion of sound science or um, a uh, science-based approach uh, has been used in the past to push for, for reduction in protection levels. Um, after Sharon, Kenneth will um, give us, uh, give us uh, an account of uh, the, the European risk approach, uh, especially uh, with a focus on the precautionary princi principle and discuss a little bit whether it is in fact enshrined as it should in U EU legislation um, or there are some loopholes that exist. Um, and he'll also uh, give us, give us uh, his insights into the current state of negotiations um, and three specific regulatory areas that are connected to them. And now I would give the floor to Sharon for her first moment. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, I am Sharon Treat with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and I'm going to talk about how the U.S. uses science, corporate self-regulation, and undue influence to lower standards. This slide um, rep represents the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. When we understand what goes into the decisions of U.S. agencies about how protective a standard should be, it's unsurprising that what comes out is so weak. The top part of this slide lists what goes into regulators' decisions. Some of this really is garbage in. Industry-funded and manipulated reports masquerading as science, data hidden behind claims of confidential business information, fuzzy math used in cost-benefit analysis to justify deregulation, conflicts of interest, and self-regulation. The bottom part of the slide is, of course, the garbage out. Dangerous pesticides allowed in agricultural fields as residue on, and as residue on food, 
livestock growth promotion drugs such as ractopamine and the cancer-causing swine drug Carbidox, post-slaughter chemical washes such as chlorine and parasitic acid instead of sanitation standards tracked at every stage of agricultural production and marketing, and lax review and regulation of genetically modified and gene edited products. Okay, so we need to understand that the US trade representative um, and the trade negotiating standards fully incorporate this garbage in standard. The US has published its objectives for the EU negotiations, and they're very clear in addition to removing tariffs on agricultural products exported to the EU, they want to get rid of so-called non-tariff berries. These are, of course, protective standards that the EU has, which the United States does not, and which has resulted in the inability of U.S. agribusiness to export many products because these U.S. products cannot meet EU food safety standards. Well, this is certainly a concern in terms of the trade negotiation. What I want to point out is that the reference here, uh, as you look down on this slide, to regulatory cooperation in order to reduce, quote, unnecessary differences in regulations and standards and the reference to agricultural biotech cooperation is probably the most dangerous part of this. As we know from um, our discussion in the last webinar um, last week. Um, so. One of the main things the U.S. really wants to do in trade agreements, and particularly having to do with the European Union, is to get rid of the precautionary principle. You hear, see here language um, that's just from the last month or two um, of U.S., high-level U.S. ambassadors and other officials talking about the precautionary principle as a stranglehold on Europe, having nothing to do with science, providing no benefit to um, health and safety. And even if the, the U.S. is unable to get rid of a, the precautionary principle, after all, it is in the foundational treaties of the European Union, chipping away at it is certainly something that the United States wants to do and it will, will attempt to do. So what does the U.S. do instead of the precautionary principle? Well, it's something that the U.S. calls risk-based regulation. Um, some people call risk-based one shorthand for it is the dose makes the poison. The idea is that most things, even if they're very um, poisonous, if the dose is very low, then it's probably okay to be exposed to it. And a lot of U.S. regulations is about how to show that not that many people are exposed or that many people are hurt. The U.S. grandfathers many, many chemicals and food uh, additives into the market, and getting them off is extremely difficult. And that's basically what uh, the major difference that I see between the precautionary principle and the risk-based principle is that the burden seems to shift in risk-based onto the regulators to show that a product is actually unsafe. And it's very hard to get something off of the market once you do. In addition, the U.S. relies heavily on um, uh, cost-benefit analysis. And this is something that's getting worse and worse uh, under the Trump administration, which is actually like manipulating numbers in a way that is really unprecedented. And we see here just some headlines from some scholarly articles about this situation. Well, what is the result? I think we all know there's at least 82 pesticides that are banned in the European Union, but they're not banned in the United States. And this is just a slide that represents that reality. Well, what else does um, the U.S. want? The U.S. wants, of course, sound science, science-based standards. And here you have two of my favorite people, Sonny Perdue, Secretary of Agriculture, and his boss, Donald Trump, saying that the European Union ignores science and that if they and they are going to actually pay the price for uh, ignoring science which you may recall might involve tariffs on European um, auto, auto, um, automobiles. So this is the language that the U.S. uses. Well what exactly is it when we talk about science um, and science-based standards? In the U.S. I think that the concept is really not the same as what you might imagine. Uh, a lot of times what it's really referring to is industry-based studies that are submitted to this U.S. government in support 
of the US government allowing various products to be on the market. And I think it's important to know that recent US trade agreements, including new NAFTA, USMCA, fully incorporate provisions that say that uh, standards of the country, other countries as part of this agreement, must be supported by science. And we know that the term sound science is actually a term invented by the tobacco industry to prevent or confuse scientific consensus, now adopted by climate um, you know, denier, change deniers, um, and many, many other industry uh, organizations and um, groups. Well, what is the product of this terrible ignorance of science on the part of the European Union? It is, of course, our favorite product, chlorine chicken. And you see here, Secretary Sonny Perdue has a little podcast where he explains that if only the European Union could understand about the importance of science, that European Union consumers would love so-called chlorine chicken, which is, of course, not what Sonny Perdue calls it. I recommend listening to this podcast if you can stand it. It's very annoying, but also quite informative. Well, here's another example of what reliance on industry science might mean. The US has approved or allowed to go onto the market Monsanto's dicamba, let me fix that again. Um, and this is a um, GMO um, manipulated corn that's resistant to uh, dicamba, um, which is a pesticide. The result of this decision, which was based on basically self, um, re non-regulation, self-approval, without going to the Food and Drug Administration, getting a, an actual decision on this, that it was safe, um, has resulted in billions of dollars of harm to farmers who do not have this kind of corn being wiped out um, by contamination of this corn um, as from pesticide drift. Here are some other crops that have been approved or allowed to go onto the market by the United States, um, which are, involve gene editing or G GMO processes. These are all things that are not necessarily approved in the European Union and are done in the United States, um, but basically based on industry self-representation. And this is policy that has just been made formal that essentially allows for uh, big egg to self-regulate on GMOs for the majority of products. So this is something that the United States wants to bring to the European Union um, by means of this trade deal um, as, as a start or perhaps regulatory cooperation. Well, I just couldn't help myself. Just who really um, cares about science? Here is President Trump caring deeply about science while looking at the solar eclipse, um, burning his eyes without protective uh, equipment. And we see here headlines about the attack on science and on scientists in the U.S. government that is basically dismantling uh, the research capacity and the ability to understand what's going on in our world based on government studies. Instead, we're going to look, as we have already, uh, at industry studies and industry data. And one of the really dangerous things about uh, trade agreements that the U.S. is entering into and the approach of the U.S. government on setting regulation is that on top of the risky risk-based approach to regulation, it's the and the misuse of the language of science, we have uh, the fact that regulators have hobbled themselves by protecting key information, hiding it from the public, regulators, and even scientific peer review by claiming that it's confidential business information. And unfortunately, this is um, a text that has been included in all recent trade agreements. This is what happens when you try to find out what is in an industry study that supports uh, something being allowed onto the market. It comes back to you after a freedom of information request completely blacked out. So you have no idea what it is and what it can do. And as I said, we're seeing this being imported into trade agreements that the United States is entering into. Here's an example from the USMCA relating to pesticide studies, which could be disclosing that people are very much in danger from a pesticide, but it's classified as uh, confidential business information and therefore protected by this trade agreement. So in sum, what we have is a web of influence uh, from uh, industry focusing on how to weaken and, um, and, and lower standards that the United States has.
a focus on risk-based standard setting, which increasingly relies on fuzzy math and cost-benefit analyses that devalue human right, life and environmental protections, and on industry-funded and often secret studies that turn the concept of science on its head. I think it's really, really important to understand that these are concepts that could very well enter into a regulatory cooperation dialogue and that the U.S. focus is targeted specifically on reducing GM oversight, on addressing pesticide residue and GM um, standards, and in particular making sure that chlorine chicken and other products such as that are available to um, be purchased in the European market. And I will end there with my contact information. Thanks. Perfect, Sharon. Thank you for this very informative input, including media uh, tips for produce podcast. I'm sure that's an interesting experience. Um, are there any questions of understanding to Sharon? I will give you a minute. And of course, you can either raise your hand or um, okay. So th there's a question from Alessa Hartmann. She's asking, could you maybe explain a bit uh, the hazard-based approach? I have seen this term being used like precautionary principle when it comes to pesticides regulation. Is it equivalent to precautionary principle and the opposite of the risk science-based approach? Yeah, I think to answer, I think that um, that can be an interchangeable term with the precautionary approach um, as opposed to a risk-based approach. So it's been used to, that term's been used for the U.S. has attacked that as well and said, well, you know, the EU has looked at some pesticides and said these are just simply too hazardous to be put onto the market. There is no safe level. And that would be the hazardous, hazardous based approach also precautionary when you don't know for sure when you know you take the precautions you weigh it on on the on the side of um, protecting people um, with the risk base it's like saying you you start off from the point of view is well how many people were really going to be hurt by this um, particular by exposure to this how can we get that down to a smaller level and then let's look at our cost benefit analysis and find out whether in fact the costs um, are, you know, worth the benefits that we have. And this is where the manipulation of math uh, by the Trump administration in particular has, you know, allowed them to basically say, well, the, the value of this regulation isn't worth the cost. Great. Thank you, Sharon. If there aren't any more follow-up questions, and I think there aren't, then I'll give the floor to Kenneth, who will um, proceed with a European view on the side of things. Kenneth, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Kenneth. I work with, uh, I'm with a corporate Europe observatory, a level watchdog in Brussels, in case you don't know us. I've, I've worked on trade policy for, well, for many years. Uh, when we had the whole uh, TTIP, um, TTIP struggle, I was deeply involved in um, in uncovering how that um, uh, that set of um, um, that those negotiations could um, could endanger European standards in various ways, be it on pesticides or food or whatever. Um, then I took a long break from trade policy, and I was brought back not not that many months ago when I when I discovered that um, the current EU US trade talks were actually touching on some of the same uh, some of the same uh, same issues. Um, my message in a in a, in a nutshell would be that um, um, that when there are EU US trade talks, the precautionary principle will always be under pressure. It's a high political priority for the US. And there are other reasons as well why um, why we will see that um, um, the precautionary principle will be um, under pressure um, in in the future as well, and not necessarily in the form of um, the U.S. forcing the European Union to renounce the principle or adopt very specific legal measures immediately that would go against the precautionary principle. Very often. Um, in this setting, it's a more, much more complicated process. This is why I, 
I brought in a slide from from the TTIP debate. Um, this this more or less is um, this is this is to show some of the mechanisms through which the negotiators back then imagined that the two sides were to figure out how to deal with the difficult issues of issue of uh, of standards. Um, some may think that the precautionary principle is kind of carved in stone in the European Union, and um, and and with good reason because in the treaty on the functioning of the European Union, the whole constitution of the EU, you find the precautionary principle in a couple of places, um, uh, chiefly not least in Article One One Nine One. Um, EU policies on the environment has to be based on the precautionary principle. And since the treaty is really the, the highest law available in the European Union, this, this um, it could, could, could put your mind at ease. Uh, the, the problem is that um, um, th that is not always, uh, it, it is not always the case that the principle is applied. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that, and that is the um, deeply entrenched hostility of a very, very large section of the uh, of, um, of European businesses um, that have been waging a battle against the precautionary principle for um, uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, I would highlight something called the European Risk Forum. Uh, it's a group of, um, of very big corporations that are mentioned here. Um, the European Risk Forum um, was set up uh, specifically to raise the debate on how to deal with, with risk in European legislation. And it is um, it is um, a group that is um, both very powerful and very hostile to the to the precautionary principle. They do realize that it will not be possible for them to get rid of the precautionary principle. So instead, their main campaign uh, for the past years have been to promote something they call the innovation principle. And their dream scenario is for the innovation principle to be accepted almost on equal terms as the precautionary principle. It would be something that comes into the debate uh, when, when a product is, is assessed. Um, it has to be treated favorably if, if there is some kind of innovation, uh, innovation at play. Could it be an interesting new chemical? Could be could be novel food? Could be could be wherever. And they've they've been pretty successful. Um, it, it was it, it was uh, only last minute that the innovation principle was taken out of the European Green Deal, which is the uh, as you know uh, the big European strategy on on climate change. So there is there is already a business hostility towards the precautionary principle and it shows at uh, at trade negotiations always uh, on the European side as well. This is just a very, very common phrase that we saw all the time when we had the TTIP negotiations. This is the uh, the food industry and um, and um, and big farmers um, in one of many, many statements about the principles that they would like to see ingrained in a trade deal between between the two sides. Procedures should be based on sound science, which is an allusion to uh, to the US, US approach. At the moment, um, um, I would I think we can identify that there are three different ways through which um, the precautionary principle can be brought into doubt at the current negotiations. Um, about the current negotiations, there is a, there's a big difference that uh, I should probably mention um, between where we are now and where we are during the TTIP days. And that is um, that the US has been threatening with imposing very high tariffs on things like uh, European cars. And that is something that really, um, that really makes, um, uh, makes uh, powerful governments in the European Union afraid. So, um, um, the, the, the risk of, uh, of concessions at the negotiation table should be taken seriously. The first set of risk is about the mandate that was, um, that was adopted in April last year. A limited mandate, uh, some would have it, um, but there is the half of the mandate is about something called conformity assessment. Conformity assessment is the product procedure through which you assess whether a product lives up to uh, to um, to the adopted standards, uh, it can be in some sectors. It can be hugely hugely important. 
how conformity assessment is um, is done. And on specifically on agriculture, uh, I believe there's there's reason to fear that things like um, things like uh, inspections uh, could come into play at a, at the, at trade negotiations. That um, um, a product uh, inspected on one side should not be inspected on uh, on the other. So there is a there is a space there for for uh, for concessions to uh, to the U.S. And then the, there's an there's an undercurrent. There is there has been work going on since the summer of 2018 to prepare for a broader uh, broader trade negotiations um, with businesses. The European Commission have discussed what could be taken up in the context of negotiations on regulatory cooperation with the U.S. Formally, they're not. They don't have a mandate yet, but it's being prepared, and it could probably be. Be, be triggered in um, in no time, and in there in that uh, body of literature, you can easily see that the issue of of standards is uh, is actually a pretty pretty high high priority. Uh, this is from a document from from the Commission. The second set of um, the second set of risks um, that you can see from the outside, it, the, the negotiations are not particularly transparent. In fact, they're very, very opaque. Um, I would say that when we had the TTIP debate, uh, what was going on at the negotiations was much easier to see than what we see nowadays. Um, in the beginning of this year, a word came out from the European Commission to um, select corner of the of, of the of the European press, um, that actually what was on the table was were issues that go well beyond uh, the mandate that the Commission got from um, from the Council last year. In response to some remarks about uh, standards in agriculture and food, uh, the Commissioner responded that. Um, things like that should be resolved in an agreement and that he was looking at non-tariff barriers as a way of bringing agriculture issues on uh, on the table. And not not long after, there were some remarks made by um, uh, by civil servants that um, work was indeed, uh, indeed ongoing on some of the very, very sensitive issues that were key to the campaign uh, against TTIP. Um, Having a problem with my slides, yeah. And the issues, obviously, I mean, we don't know the whole the whole set of issues that were discussed uh, at, at that time in the beginning of this year, uh, but three were clearly identifiable, and they were uh, they were pesticides, um, they were uh, and uh, pathogen reduction treatment. So that's the chlorinated chicken. Um, they're not using the same chlorinated substance nowadays as I understand it in the US. It's more, um, 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 they, they use a, a substance called acetic acid, acid or peroxy acetic acid. And then there's GMOs. On, on those three issues, there were serious talks between the Commission and, uh, and, uh, and the US. And uh, on all three examples, we can clearly see that the per, the precautionary principle is um, is brought into uh, brought into question. Um, the third risk to make th things even more difficult for ourselves, uh, the Commission has um, um, discovered a, a method to appease the the US uh, without even without really having to ask for a mandate. And we've seen that on two occasions. Uh, just before the TTIP negotiations kicked off, uh, the Commission uh, had, a, had um, uh, a proposal adopted uh, to allow uh, the use of lact lactic acid in, um, in beef production, um, clearly quoting that this was, this was a way of, um, of, uh, of uh, getting a better relationship with the US side ahead of the ahead of the TTIP negotiations and then and then last year um, a, this, um, a proposal was adopted tabled by the Commission um, to uh, approve uh, diesel uh, biofuel produced on soy um, and allow it to get uh, the uh, approval as a sustainable type of fuel 
which was um, um, denounced by many environmental groups uh, across Europe because um, um, they felt that it, it had been proved in, in many ways that uh, biofuel based on soil is, is, is definitely not, uh, not sustainable. In both cases, these were proposals that the commission could table without asking anyone. And since they are of the type called the implementing acts, acts uh, they could be they could could be um, adopted uh, adopted easily. There would have to be a qualified majority against the proposal of the commission if it were to be uh, to be rejected. So it's kind of um, it's kind of a, an, an extra method of the commission that allows them to give concessions to uh, to the U.S. Uh, without going have to, having to go through all the hassle of a of a trade mandate and importantly without having to ask the European Parliament. Um, I'd say at the moment in the European Parliament there isn't all that much focus on this uh, on this set of EU, this set of, of trade talks. Um, the Commission has been largely successful in um, in uh, convincing Parliament that uh, our standards are not in peril. Uh, this quote in particular is something that um, uh, that um, uh, European parliamentarians uh, were happy to hear. Uh, Com Commissioner Hogan said in February 2020 that we will not agree to the changes in our regulations that will reduce our standards across the board in terms of environment or food standards or whatever. The, the problem here is the, is the word that I've underlined across the board. Uh, it may be that the Commission is not in a position to give the kind of concessions that would uh, encompass lots of products at the same time, but they do have they do have the option of um, of giving the kind of concessions that we saw with lactic acid in 2012 and soy diesel in 2019. So, in in sum. Um, to, to follow the, the trade talks adequately and to perform a kind of the kind of defense that we need uh, to secure the precautionary principle, you will have to dig into you will have to dig into um, the work done by obscure committees and um, and uh, expert groups in, in in the European Commission because um, a very long time ago the Commission realized that um, to be able to to um, to get trade agreements with the Americans, they would have to work in a very sophisticated manner. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Perfect. Um, I think you showed that the major problem uh, we have in the context of these talks is that much more is going on than is, uh, well, A, shown on the surface, um, as, as, as hinted on by, by remarks of officials, and um, also that more is going on than what was granted by the mandate that the council passed in, in, like in April 2019. Um, regulatory cooperation obviously isn't uh, only a problem anymore when enshrined in agreements, but has to be regarded in the larger context of the Commission's policy making. And um, I think this, this underlines the, the urgent need we have to, to transparency uh, in these talks and, and trade policy, the Commission's policy making in general, um, which means in this context at the most basic minimum to adhere to the Commission rules um, that were set up with, with former Commissioner Malmström's uh, trade for all policy, which would include um, reports of negotiation rounds, which we haven't seen uh, any of these in, in, in the current US talks. Um, before we jump into questions of understanding to Kenneth, just a quick note um, that you receive an email, a follow-up email with the recording of the webinar session as well as the presentation slides. Um, are there any questions regarding Kenneth's input first? Just wait another minute. If there aren't any questions of understanding, then feel free 
Uh, there's one question by Steve uh, to Kenneth. Uh, have you given a presentation like this to the Trade and Investment Committee of the Parliament? Is the Parliament too, too preoccupied with COVID-19 to pay attention to these negotiations without mandate? I haven't, I haven't addressed the committee in the European Parliament. I have been in touch with parliamentarians from both the, both the Green Group and the, and the Left Wing Group. And uh, yeah, I mean, they are keeping an eye some, somehow. I don't see the wave of formal questions to the Commission that I would like to see um, just yet. But it's not that it's completely forgotten. They know they're, they're going on. And um, at least, I mean, they're interested enough in it that they um, that they invite me to 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 web talks like this one Sharon maybe you can uh, add to, to to what extent uh, US regulators uh, have an open year for, for this kind of issues not so much yeah. concerning the mandate but the kind of, of uh, negotiating objectives that were put up and yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the U.S. has always been less transparent, or at least it's been less transparent than Europe as in the TTIP negotiations where, you know, pressure was put on the EU government to actually post text. In the United States, there's never been any of that. And one of the slides I jumped over um, in, in the interest of time was just showing the number of corporate advisors that serve on these advisory committees to the U.S. Trade Representative who really have the inside track. They have the opportunity to review text that the U.S. government is thinking of uh, putting forward and um, often offer their own text, um, you know, dra fully drafted to the U.S. government, which unfortunately you know, uses that. So there's very little transparency. And I think from the point of view of Congress, they're not even particularly aware of this. The U.S. Trade Representative or USTR did go to Congress to formally get um, negotiating um, objectives put, um, you know, in, into um, law, but then they proceeded to engage in a negotiation that didn't, wasn't for a complete trade agreement and then started talking about doing some kind of mini deal that could be put into place without actually going to Congress for approval. So we see from the Trump administration, you know, really kind of um, evading the, the li fairly limited oversight that, that used to exist when we were, you know, going through the TTIP negotiations to make it that much worse. And as Kenneth said, using the threat of tariffs to really kind of push back on the European Union in a way that wasn't done previously. You're muted, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a question by Helena uh, to all. If you could imagine that the COVID-19 restrictions preventing demonstrations on the street will be used to rapidly progress uh, TTIP uh, 2.0 our views. Maybe I can just wait, make one remark um, and then give over to the speakers. Um, I think we've already seen it. I mean, the EU-Mexico agreement was uh, finished without much fuss or um, its finalization was, was announced last week, the week before that. Um, and the, I mean, information flows between the Commission and civil society or the Trade Commission and civil society have been uh, kind of stopped since Phil Hogan took over. Um, they abandoned the practice of, of regular dialogues, which weren't that much of a great thing to begin with. Um, but the last one that was done since the crisis started in Europe, at least, uh, was done in cooperation with, a, with an uh, Irish think tank, uh, where, where a lot of uh, uh, businesses and, and, and banks, uh, most of all, are present. So. If this is the, the, the shape that uh, dialogues with civil society will take in the future, I think that's also already a dire sign. Um, yeah, maybe your thoughts, Sharon, Kenneth? Well, anything, yeah. that, what I would add on the COVID situation is we see that, 
In the U.S., that's being used as an excuse for further deregulation, which, you know, some, some of us felt like you couldn't actually get worse. And now they're just like stopping, you know, a whole bunch of regulations under the, the saying, well, we can't do it because of COVID-19. And then at the same time, you know, one of the things specific to the European Union that I wonder about is some of the happy talk about what could be done um, in a EU-US agreement is like, well, we can, you know, cooperate on medical device standards and medical uh, equipment uh, and product standards. And this will enable us to help, you know, address the, the pandemic, which could very well obscure what is really the agenda, which is what Kenneth and I have been talking about, which is to get rid of the precautionary principle and allow all kinds of agricultural goods onto the EU market that are currently banned by uh, EU regulations. Mm -hmm. Maybe just to follow up with that, because uh, uh, it, it, it follows up quite, quite nicely. Do you think there will be any changes, uh, assuming there would be a Biden administration um, to the demands that the US is putting forward? Uh, and why is there a rush now to negotiate with the USTR? The application of tariffs takes time and even a temporary application would like be withdrawn by the Biden administration. Well, we don't, we don't really know, but we know that Biden was part of the Obama administration that was hell-bent to negotiate the, the original TTIP. And so there were a lot of concerns about that as well as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I don't think it's at all a foregone conclusion that the Biden administration would withdraw a negotiation with the European Union. And certainly the demands of industry are, you know, they're the same demands that were there for the TTIP negotiations. They've continued on and they have, you know, really infected the U.S. government significantly. I mean, I would at least hope under a Biden administration, we would see a reversal of a lot of this deregulation, you know, an increase in respect for science and scientists, a focus on things like climate change. And so there are some areas where I think that it would be different, but um, I, I think all along in the U.S., the attitude towards particularly a European Union agreement has been, well, there's really not that much to fear. It's not like we're offshoring jobs to economies that pay people less than they do in the United States and don't have health insurance, you know, and, and put us at a competitive disadvantage. So I think there's going to need to be a great deal of education of the Biden administration, which, you know, could happen after the election or before in terms of just understanding where things have moved on and, and the importance of maybe resetting the way we think about trade policy and the economy in the wake of the pandemic and thinking about how to do things differently, um, considering that a lot of these policies we have really kind of contributed to the situation we're in right now. Thank Can you. I say about yeah, the European side? Please, please about add to the, this. the rush to get an agreement with the US. Um, it, when, um, when the new commission um, was um, was uh, selected last year. Um, the uh, head of the commission, the president, uh, wrote a series of mission letters to its uh, its commissioners. And in the one on trade, uh, what is, the, I'd say, almost top priority in the mission letter to Phil Hogan was to make sure that there would be a, some sort of agreement with uh, with the U.S. And and this is about it's about the fear of the fear of tariffs. Um, so I mean, you you can expect Hogan Hogan to be on the case uh, around the clock to make sure that Trump is not tempted in any way to impose high tariffs on uh, on cars uh, on cars in particular. I mean, one last thing I would say, um, and it goes back to the idea of this may be being a mini deal. Is you know, I really felt I mean, all along, what is uh, guiding Trump in much of what he does is his polling numbers and you know his potential to get reelected. So having come up with something here that doesn't in their opinion have to go to the US Congress for review and maybe could be done quickly, um, there's always the potential that uh, you know President Trump would want to get a deal at some point before the election um, or at least claim that you know they've come to come to agreement on something so that he can then wave it around is another great accomplishment of his administration that will restore the economy after being decimated by COVID. So I think that's always out there. And, you know, it, it, 
it, a lot of this just seems to be politics and, and, and as Ken said, around the cars as well uh, and the European side. And that's not necessarily based, you know, it's based on the political fortunes of the people that are doing these negotiations, a lot of it. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one last question. Um, of course, unless uh, anyone else wants to raise their voice. Um, to Sharon, or I think both of you can answer, uh, if you could tell something about the implications to CETA, uh, and if the situation in Canada is comparable to the US, um, this coming from the background that there's a ratification process of CETA in the Netherlands, although I'm not sure about which implications, uh, but I have I have um, one thing that I'd I'd like to raise raise one issue um, yes, please about please. about pesticides um, because there's been an interesting development in in the European Union over the past weeks. Uh, it's now the official position of the Commission that the internal rules on pesticides uh, have to apply to imported goods as well, um, which means that um, food or goods uh, with even the slightest trace of a pesticide forbidden in the European Union mm -hmm. uh, cannot be allowed to be imported. And that has implications for CETA mm -hmm. um, because apparently a couple of years ago the Commission uh, let it slide to the Canadians that this, that, that, um, that this would not, um, the internal rules of the European Union on pesticides would not necessarily have strong implications for the for Canadian export. If, yeah, and if what the Commission said recently is true and if they're consistent about it, uh, the, commission, the Canadians stand to lose uh, um, exports to the European market to the sound of two, 2 billion euros, I think. On the other hand, I mean, we will expect the Canadians to fight back and CETA is their, 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 best, uh, their best bet. Well, and, and related to that, I mean, we know from reports that have, you know, been put together by civil society that the CETA regulatory cooperation discussions have involved the Canadians pushing to allow for residue, pesticide residue and other things, and the negotiators there for the European Union, or regulators, I guess, in, involved in a regulatory cooperation discussion, um, making comments that make it sound like they might be willing to do that. And I think that this is why, you know, we, we don't know for sure what's going to happen there, but certainly any discussion of that nature involving um, the United States, I think you would see a similar thing. And I guess, you know, my um, reason for really being so concerned about the regulatory cooperation agenda here, which is front and center from the U.S. as well, especially focused on these ag biotech things like GMOs, is that um, we, we know it's been used in the past to lower regulations. It's happening in CETA. It happened in the, with the Canadian government in its internal regulatory cooperation process that they have. And I think that that is where there could be a lot of danger because it isn't front and center as a trade agreement is. Is a so-called living agreement that continues on over time when people really aren't paying attention, mm -hmm. and and under the under secrecy of that sort, you know, really bad things can happen. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, there's uh, a question, a live question request. I'm giving the floor to Michael or Michael Hemminghaus. Please, Michael, go ahead. Michael, you can. Looks like it's muted. Yeah, you, you have to unmute yourself. You sure? Okay. Can you mute, unmute it? Uh, yes, no. I did. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Ha, no. Yeah, Michael Hemminghaus from Germany. In our protests, there were three points or four points. But one point you, you uh, pointed out, uh, it's pesticides and standards of uh, food. And 
but uh, uh, there are s s three other points. The uh, first one is the data protection. Mm -hmm. They said we have a safe harbor. I said US is never a safe harbor. It would be never be a safe harbor because uh, we have uh, European standards and a lot of protests against uh, against uh, 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 weakening data protection with the D. SGO, uh, GVO, uh, VO. That's one point. How do? Uh, how is the uh, 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 momentan uh, uh, struggle uh, uh, about this point? The second point is the uh, uh, arbitrage trials, uh, be, be, because uh, last uh, Minister Zikra Gabriel uh, um, said we need an international trial court like the, like the court in Den Haag. So that, that's the second point. And uh, the third point uh, that has bring us to protest is the uh, um, uh, regulatory competence of uh, multinational uh, uh, companies before doing, uh, before uh, 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 regulating anything to influence in not in the uh, not in the the sin of uh, 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 um, people or, or a civil uh, movement, but in the sin of companies. And what's this, what what's the, 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 the today uh, uh, discussion in the U.S. about that? Uh, this point. Okay. So thank you, Michael. Um, I think um, if, if, I think both of you might want to say something about that, but I would like yeah. to ask you to uh, be briefly with your answers. Um, yeah. So we can take one last question that popped up by Nina Reinecke, and then I will close the uh, list of questions. Okay. Well, first I would just say that um, I absolutely agree. There's other things that are concerned, for example, digital policies. But um, since I'm working for the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and I was asked to focus specifically on the food and ag issues. So, um, but absolutely. Um, the questions around investor state dispute settlement and those kinds of things, um, I think probably aren't on the table right now with um, the Trump administration in this negotiation. That is was excluded out of the mandate and certainly the Trump administration in its recent new NAFTA scaled back on that and the current trade representative Robert Lighthizer is not uh, a fan of ISDS. Um, so, so that is there, um, but certainly um, these are issues in terms of concern about corporations kind of running the world uh, and influencing these standards in the United States. Their civil society in the United States also has concerns and I think that there has been a lot of concerns about trade agreements in, in general, in terms of just um, lowering standards and, and reducing opportunities for, for good jobs in the United States. Um, so I'll turn it over to Kenneth. Yeah, Anyone? just just quickly, and regulatory cooperation, that was your, your third point, Mikhail. That, that is being discussed and that is part of the negotiations uh, at the moment. Uh, but but the other the other points there at the moment they are not on the table. What is on the table is first. I mean the reason why we discuss agriculture and food uh, so much. It's not just because of our own passions. It's because that's what that's what is the polit that's where the political drama is at the moment. That's where the United States states has put its emphasis uh, months ago. Thank you, Kenneth and Sharon. Um, so, for the last question, um, do you know which role the EU-UK bilateral trade negotiations play in all of this? The American Chemistry Council have joined forces with the UK chemical industry to push for more regulatory cooperation, emphasizing the strong alignment between US and UK. Uh, whoever wants to go first, the floor is yours. Yeah, I've been spending a lot of time on the UK-US negotiations. I would just say that part of the US agenda is to weaken standards in the UK and by that means put pressure on the European Union to weaken standards uh, in the European Union. That is part of their agenda. Um, and on the part of the UK, part of their agenda is to say, hey, you know, 
we're, we're the big boys. We're now negotiating and cutting deals with the United States. We don't need the European Union. We don't have to abide by your standards. We can set our own standards. And so it's very much a political negotiation, I think. And you're right to, to raise that as, as a concern, um, you know, whether it's effective uh, in, in actually achieving those goals is, is a different question. I, I don't know yet. Uh, Maybe Kenneth has thoughts on well, that. Well, the problem, the problem for the UK quite generally, not just in the UK's talk with the US, is that the other side would really like to know what they're buying into and um, to what extent they can consider a deal with the UK as kind of a deal with the European Union as well. So there seems to be some hesitation but, uh, and some, uh, there seems to be a stalemate at many of the negotiations that the UK have um, have initiated, uh, presumably because the negotiating partners are waiting to see what an EU-UK uh, agreement will look like. But on that point, the US is, is going full steam ahead regardless of what comes out. And I think, you know, going to that US agenda, which is not necessarily the agenda of the American people, let's be clear, mm. but going to that U.S. you know, industry and, and government agenda, um, it's like it, if we can pull the U.K. apart from the EU during the negotiations right now that they're having with the EU, all the better. Um, that, will, that will help us weaken the EU, that will help us get what we want in the U.K. and ultimately it will be good for, you know, American um, agribusiness and all these other big component companies, including the chemical companies, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a bad note to end on. But um, <laughs> I, I, I think though they are thinking ahead about this sort of thing and, 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 and they've even been somewhat uh, public about that agenda in the US. Okay, um, so much of the last words, uh, Kenneth, unless you want to add a last remark. Um, I thank you too very much for, for, for speaking in, uh, with such insight about this uh, certainly complicated issue of uh, different regulations and uh, how um, lobbies and, and uh, regulators are cooperating to get rid of them. Um, thank you who participated, who joined us for this session and for last week. Uh, as I said, you will receive a follow-up email um, with a recording and uh, the slides of the, the presentations that Kenneth and, and Sharon gave. Uh, and of course, if you need any other follow-up uh, questions, material, answers, uh, then feel free to contact me or the speakers, I'm sure. And um, thank you all and uh, have a nice afternoon or evening or day in the year. Okay. <laughs> and thank, thank you. Bye-bye. I really appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye. -bye. bye.